Hello and welcome to the Big Time Strength Podcast featuring small school strength coaches from around the nation that are making the big time where they're at. This episode is brought to you by Team Builder. Team Builder is the leading software for high schools and colleges that provides coaches the ability to write programs online, generate more than a dozen reports, and even train athletes remotely for site income. Right now, if you sign up with code BIGTIME, you will receive a free APRE programming template which works automatically within Team Builder. No more spreadsheets and workout cards to track training maxes that change day by day. Automate your programming without outsourcing your programming with Team Builder. This episode is also brought to you by Powerlift. Taking your athletic facility from concept to completion can be a challenge. At Powerlift, it's our goal to make the process as seamless as possible from start to finish. Our weight equipment is made with the toughest materials that can withstand excessive use from coaches and athletes. It's sought after for its unique design, customizable appearance, affordability, and our superior warranty that training facilities want and need. Our weight rooms are designed with the athlete in mind, and we pride ourselves on our ability to outfit athletic facilities based on a team's unique goals. That's why high schools, colleges, universities, professional sports teams, and athletic performance facilities around the world have chosen us to help maximize their strength training facilities. Call us today if you want to be contacted with a rep in your area. Give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to see for yourself why our clients are Powerlift Proud. Now, let's go ahead and get on to this week's episode. Today, we have Coach Sam Schmidt. He is from, uh, he's working down at Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa. So getting started today, Coach, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background and uh, kind of tell you what is, or tell us what you got going on now. Well, first and foremost, I appreciate you having me on. I uh, love what you guys are doing with this podcast. Um, but yeah, I, I come from a uh, small town called Missouri Valley, Iowa, right on the southwest uh, border of Iowa, net, right next to Nebraska. Very small town, about 2,500 people graduated with around 60. Um, just one of those small towns where everybody knows everybody. Um, so grew up there. From there, I actually um, went and got my bachelor's degree from Central College. Um, get a little flack about that from around here in Simpson. But yeah, I graduated from Central. Um, that's where I studied exercise science, got into strength and conditioning. Um, also played football there for four years. Um, from there, I kind of wanted to test the waters a little bit to see if I wanted to go to grad school. Wasn't 100% sure if I wanted to pursue a master's or not. So I actually volunteer interned at the University of Northern Iowa that summer of 2017, helped with football, volleyball, and various other sports. From there, uh, Coach Jed Smith asked me if I wanted to stay on as a GA, obviously happily accepted, Um, got my master's there in 2018, um, obviously through the grad assistantship program. Uh, From there, I put some my name out there for some big, uh, I wanted to try to test out the big school waters a little bit. Um, Got lucky enough to get accepted at the University of Iowa as a football strength and conditioning intern from January 2019 to January 2020. Um, So I was there for a whole year, um, enjoyed every minute of that. And then, you know, I wanted uh, I had never left Iowa before. So I started looking at other jobs. And as most people know, um, at some point, you have to be willing to kind of move in this industry. I'm um, unfortunate there's only so many strength conditioning jobs in the state of Iowa. Um, so I actually got reached out to about a job opening at Austin P State University down in Clarksville, Tennessee, um, FCS school, um, just an assistant role down there. So I ended up taking that job, moved down there February of 2020, um, stayed down there until July of 2021. So it was down there about a year and a half. Um, and then as my time there came to close, I got saw an opening at Simpson as the director of strength and conditioning, put my name in the hat, um, applied, interviewed, and obviously accepted the role of the head strength and conditioning coach. So I've been here technically since August, um, so been about six, seven months. Um, so that's kind of my journey, kind of my path that kind of got to got me to uh, here in Indianola. Awesome. And uh, there was a name there that we hear a lot on this show, Central College. Um, yeah. Central Central seems to be a kind of strength coach you. It seems like about every other person we've got on the on the show had uh, some kind of association with Central College. So maybe uh, right. maybe tell us just a little bit about what that experience was like in your undergrad and internship and how that kind of 
help push you down the path to uh, becoming a strength coach? Yeah, so I knew going going into college what I wanted to do. Um, I know a lot, a lot of kids go like the freshman year, they're still deciding. I knew right away I wanted to be a strength coach. Uh, that was why I went to Central. Obviously, football was a big bonus, um, but the, the main reason was um, after visiting the strength conditioning department, talking to the exercise science department, I knew right away that's where I wanted to go. Uh, but no, it, it was really good. You know, uh, Kyle Johnson runs a really, really good program there. Um, kind of teaches you the ins and outs of being, uh, you know, a beginning level intern, kind of teaches you what they do at Central, and then kind of teaches you how to branch out and get other jobs. Um, it was really good for me. Um, you kind of get thrown in. I kind of got thrown into the fire as I saw. I think it was my, I want to say my second semester as a freshman. He just came up to me and said, hey, you're running men's golf. I never made a program before. Um, hadn't used Excel before. Excel then was a foreign language to me. Um, I just started putting stuff onto a paper. He kind of led me in the right direction. Um, and my first program, looking back on it, obviously program completely different now, but it was, you know, opportunities that I, like that that led me to be more comfortable with using Excel programming and stuff like that. Um, it's you get he gives you a lot of opportunities to work with different teams. I think I worked with every single team there at some point, whether it was just helping set up, actually leading groups. Um, it, yeah, it was good. He's hard on you. He holds a very hard or high expectation, but he definitely sets you up um, for success. You know, when, when I was done and went through my internship all four years there. I grew immensely as a coach from a freshman that was afraid to talk in front of anybody to a senior that was able to lead his own groups. Um, so it's went through some growing pains for sure, but j just the way he runs it, um, it sets guys, up, guys and girls up for success. Um, I think the biggest thing is I don't think there's any secret formula to how he programs, how he um, teaches his interns. It's just consistency. Like he has his standard, he has his expectation and he's consistent with it. Like, you know what to expect day in and day out. Um, and if you do right by him, he's going to do right by uh, you. Um, he helped me get the Iowa internship. You know, he reached out to grads, uh, Jed Smith at UNI for me. So, yeah, he runs a very good program there. I'm trying to, and that's kind of what I'm kind of taking here. Like we just started an internship program here at Simpson, trying to kind of emulate and take it a step further than what we did at Central. So. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, the, the internship, whenever you are, um at a small division three school you know you're going to be really limited with what you have from a staffing standpoint and yeah um you know that's just going to be the reality you know, they, like financially you're not going to have you know three four or five coaches on staff right if you're lucky you maybe have an assistant and then it's probably going to be interned so maybe right. uh maybe just talk to us a little bit about you know kind of what your internship looks like how many interns you have and and what you're kind of doing to to manage those guys and help develop them as coaches Right. Uh, so I'm actually lucky enough to have a full time assistant here um, so that, you know, it goes a very, very long way, like you said, at a division three school. And one of the first things we wanted to do was develop an internship program, you know, and it wasn't just a program where, hey, you come in, clean your racks, set up for the lift, tear down and that's it. You know, we wanted to develop coaches. So two, three, three years down the road with our comfortable programming, we can give them a smaller team where they can start leading groups where they can start you know, making their own lift cards if that's how they deem fit and all that stuff. Um, so when we first got here, it was, you know, me and my assistant. Um, and then we actually had four, they call it undergraduate uh, GAs. So it's pretty much a paid student coach, essentially. So we had those four the first semester, obviously kind of, we had to teach them the expectation and the standards and kind of told them like, hey, like, if you want to continue to do this, you know, we want you to start programming for teams and like leading groups and stuff like that. Uh, so those four, you know, our original four have done a very, very good job. And then this semester, we actually offer credit for an internship curriculum. So we have three practicums. Uh, the first practicum is just teaching them the basic principles of strength and conditioning. Um, everything that goes into developing an athlete, um, everything that goes into reverse engineering a sport, putting it onto a lift card, um, different teachings that they need to kind of go through and learn how to teach and correct and stuff like that. Um, so right now in our internship class, we have 15 and then we have our and then we have three or four uh, undergraduate UGA. So we have a very big internship class um, and they all kind of play a hand in helping with different teams. Um, it's going very well. Obviously, some growing pains. It's the very first semester. Um, but pretty much the plan is, you know, curriculum curriculum one, like I said, teach them the ins and outs. 
as we kind of progress, get into more into our more specific programming, whether it's, you know, high, low, the tier system, you know, Mike Boyle's template, kind of giving them different options and different tools to their toolbox. And the third, we kind of see it as more of a networking, resume building, annual plan building and stuff like that. Um, we've only gone through the first curriculum since this is our first semester of doing it. Um, but that's kind of how we see it moving forward in the future. And obviously, given the guys and girls lots of opportunities to coach, you know, lead groups and stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's a that's an incredible intern staff just from a size perspective to be able to. Yeah, we're we're very, very lucky for sure. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and I love I love that kind of point you made there about you know, almost having like three phases of, of development yeah. for those guys. And each one kind of builds upon, upon the last. And, you know, that last one kind of being like, Hey, okay, now it's time for you to, to go get a big boy job or big girl job. And, and, you know, making sure that you guys are setting them up for success there is, is really cool. Um, you mentioned, you know, a couple different, uh, you know, training philosophies, templates, whatever you want to call it, tier system, Mike Boyle, high, low, uh, what are some right. of your favorite uh, training methodologies that you're using with your athletes? So I have, I've kind of changed the way I've gone about things throughout my years. Um, you know, when I first started, it was back squatting, Olympic lifting. Um, and then when I finally started doing my own research, I've kind of, you know, steered away from that, whether it's right or wrong. It's just, I, it's my own personal philosophy. So what we do here, at least try our best to do here is high, low. Um, you know, I've listened to anywhere from, Nick DeMarco talk about it. Um, Coach Tucker at Villanova talk about it. Um, and that's just the way we like going about things. Um, a big part of it is because it opens a line of communication with our coaches. Um, like right now, we have two or three coaches that will come down and say, hey, if we want to do some tempo runs this week, what day should we do it on to match it up with our lifting? Like if we want to do some sprints after practice, you know, short 10, 15 yards sprints, what day should we do it? Um, so that's something we really, really like because it's more than just what they do in the weight room. It's obviously what they're doing on the field and the court. Um, so we're, we're huge in the high low. Um, we always teach our interns and our staff to always analyze the sport first, work backwards from it. We always make our interns go like physically go to a practice and watch it. Um, from there, we tell them to analyze the athlete, figure out your different phases, whether it's in season, out of season, spring ball, post spring ball, stuff like that. And then that from there, you kind of start designing your template and your program. Um, so obviously, with our high, low, in a perfect world, we can control what they all do at practice. Obviously, sometimes, you know, coaches may steer away from what they originally have planned. Um, so we always have a way to adjust that as well. Um, but yeah, we're, we're big into high, low here. A lot of stuff to still learn about it. We're always, you know, evolving our programming and learning uh, the way to go about it. Uh, but kind of seeing the different uh, phases of pro our different styles of programming throughout my, you know, six, seven years of being in this industry. That's kind of what I hang my hat on right now. Three, four years from now, it definitely can change because um, we're always trying to make the best program go about the best way that's going to benefit our athlete. Um, but yeah, right now, you know, it's mostly high low. We give our interns uh, some leeway as how they want to program so they can kind of find, you know, their niche and their comfortability level. Uh, but like I said, we give them different, different tools to add to their toolbox and they can kind of pick which way they want to go with it. Yeah, that's awesome, Coach. And I think, uh, you know, one of the most important things, if you're looking at kind of that Charlie Francis high-low model, um, yeah. is, right, the whole point is consolidating stressors. So you talked mm -hmm. about it a little bit there. You know, you have to have your sport coaches on board with that, right? Because it's Absolutely. not just it's not just what we're doing in the weight room, right? It's, it's what's going on at practice and um, how you're kind of tying that all together. So maybe right. talk a little bit about um, – you know, what developing that relationship with the sport coach has been like? Have you had coaches just kind of on board right from the start with it? Or has mm -hmm. that been kind of a process in your first, you know, six to seven months here of developing that relationship and getting those guys to trust you so that you can be on the same page? Um, it, it's a, it's kind of as a little bit of both. I mean, some took more times than others and some were on board right away, which is understandable. You know, some coaches have seen one way of doing things that may have worked. Um, some coaches were open to new ideas. Um, so the biggest thing with us is, you know, educating the coaches and the athletes of why this type of lifting is going to benefit, you know, the sport of football or it's going to benefit the sport of softball or baseball. Um, because if you just tell them, you know, if we run high low, it's going to make them, 
you know, trap our deadlift more, our split squat more, all right, and never relate it back to the sport, which is why these athletes came to the school, um, then it's going to be hard for them to hop on board. Um, so a good example of um, a coach that actually hopped on board pretty quickly was a football coach we hear at Simpson. He, one of my first days in, he came in. I just asked him like, so how do you lay out your practice? Like, what's your, what's your walkthrough day? What's your shell day? What's your full pad day? And then from there, we're able to watch the sport, watch the practice, and then lay out a schedule in here as far as, all right, today's their full, their full padded practice. You know, they have a live period, you know, they are full speed kickoff, all right? Let's make that our high day in the weight room. All right, then Mondays might be their walkthrough. Okay, let's make that our low day in the weight room. Um, so educating the coach and staff is saying if we can balance these stressors and not overload the athlete throughout the week so they're fresh on Saturday or Tuesday or whenever they play, all right, it's going to help them hop on board a lot quicker. Um, it's another big thing teaching the coaches and also the athletes that, like you said, stress anywhere, stress everywhere. You know, if, I, if I'm going to hit a low day on the highest practice day, Okay, they're going to have to recover from something, you know, some, something's going to um, tax them. Um, so it's just kind of educating those coaches of why we do the way that we do. Now, there's some coaches that, hey, I've done it this way. What do you think? Okay, maybe we can find a way to meet in the middle. Um, because at the end of the day, we both want uh, what's best for the athletes. We want them to succeed. We want them to win. Um, so kind of finding that happy medium with maybe the coaches that might take a little bit, get on board. And then as you develop that relationship with them, as you develop the trust with them and show them, you know, our athletes are, you know, more fresh, you know, they're more resilient to injury, then hopefully eventually we can get to the point where you meet with the coaches, map out practice schedules together, practice intensities together and stuff like that. Um, but that's not going to happen in one day. It's not going to happen in one year. It's just continuing to educate, communicate, and just build an overall relationship with the coaches. Sure. So, uh, just kind of going with that football example, what does uh, what is maybe a typical day of or week of training look like for you guys in that high low model, um, especially when we're talking like in season and they're practice practicing pretty heavily? Yep. So in season, obviously going to vary a little bit different than what we do out of season. But in season, for example, you know, football is a very easy example because they always play on the same day have the same number of practices. Um, so how we kind of map it out is um monday so they play on saturday um monday is kind of like their walkthrough day um so the watch film walk through practice and then that's our low day in the weight room so upper body emphasis if we do any sort of plyos it's good it's extensive plyos um so that that's kind of what we deem our low day uh tuesday they kind of they go into their shells um we use that just scheduling wise with all these teams that we have we use that as an off day so not ideal, obviously, um, but just with scheduling, we kind of had to make it work. So Tuesday's off. Wednesday is their full padded practice where they go 100 miles an hour, full pads, have a live period. Um, and that's the day. That's the highest day in the weight room. So that's our lower body strength day emphasis, um, you know, it, intensive plyos. If we were to do any sort of speed training, that'd be like our max velocity day. Obviously, don't do a lot of that in season. Thursday's off, um, completely off for bulk because that's kind of what they, they're, it's another walkthrough if you, that's what you want to call it, uh, completely off. And then Friday, okay, they call it fast Friday on the football field, short 40, 45 minute practice. Um, term we like to use is the primer day. Uh, so that's what we do in here. It's a lot of ex explosive jumps, explosive, explosive throws, um, might throw in some drop in fly tens in there, um, just fast moving you know, fast pace, fast tempo to kind of match what they have out at practice so they can get primed and be fresh for Saturday, which is obviously the ultimate goal. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I think, uh, like I said, too much, especially in football, um, too much of the old school mentality is just, man, like grind them into the ground so that the practice, yeah. you know, practice is the hardest thing they do in the week and makes the games easy. But I think we're, we're slowly starting to figure out that that's not really the way the human body works. So, yeah, yeah. Like I like obviously going through, you know, my own research and all this stuff, just hearing about the schools that the Sunday after a game, you know, that's their big squat day. You know, they're getting in the weight room and squatting to me. It's just like, I mean, what, like, what's the point, you know, is that, is it really worth it doing stuff like that? Like when I first started, I thought, yep, that's the way to do it. That's how way everyone should do it. But as you learn how to, balance stressors and how important recovery actually is 
I, you, you kind of learn how if you can balance practice in the game with your weight room, it's going to be that much more beneficial. You know, we're trying to teach our athletes that more is not always better. Okay. More film, more technique work. Most time that's better, but you know, more squats in the weight room when it's an off day of lifting, you know, if you're going to come in here. We don't do Olympic lifts, but you want to do power cleans on your own time when it's on one of our low days. Okay. That's, that's going to be more detrimental in the long run than it is going to be beneficial for you. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, something that I've, that's been kind of a common theme that I've heard here with you so far is, uh, you know, talking about, you know, well, this is, this may be how I would have done it, you know, five, six years ago, but, you know, I've done my research, I've changed my mind on stuff and, and we're keeping, yep. you know, trying to find ways to do things better. So what are, you know, maybe some of your go-to uh, professional development resources, where are you trying to get to, to, to learn uh, most of this stuff that you're implementing with your athletes? Um, I think at first you have to follow the right people. Um, social media in today's day and age is huge. Um, you need to follow people for the content that they're posting, not the noise that they're making. So some, uh, an example of that was don't just follow the coach that, you know, posts motivational quotes every day, post videos of him screaming, hopping up and down, but you go through the Twitter feed, there's not a single educational piece, not a single piece of programming. Um, and sometimes that those are the most quote unquote well-known guys in the industry. Um, so I think following the right people on Twitter. So some of my go-tos are, um, I've named him before as Elon Sport Performance. So Nick DeMarco's program that he's got going there. Um, huge uh, Coach Tucker fan at Villanova. Um, Andrew Ryland's a big coach I've been following with his contact uh, contact prep and stuff like that. Um, there, there's a lot of good guys. The list can go on and on for me. There's a lot of smarter coaches out there than me. Um, and I just kind of take pieces that I like um, and put them together. Um, Strength Coach Network's a huge, a huge new educational piece that's out there right now i'm sure a lot of people have heard of it um with the rugby strength coach Kier running that um that's something i have that i'm working my way through um it's and like i said sometimes it's just as simple as seeing what other people do if you like it if you don't you can take it um but it's just getting your name out there actually taking initiative to watch videos read articles and stuff like that um because there's some coaches where because I follow, you know, Andrew Ryland, he follows someone else. He posts a video. I like what that coach posts. So then I follow him and might learn something from him or her. Um, but yeah, th those are my three or four big names. And obviously the strength coach network is a big thing as well. Um, if I were to, you know, throw anything out there, those would probably be the uh, most impactful for me right now anyways. Yeah, I would, I would totally echo and agree with everything you just said. I know those are all um, some names that have had a pretty big influence on me and I just put out a ton of good free educational content on Twitter like Twitter can be uh, a place that absolutely kind of you know takes you down these deep dark rabbit holes of yeah uh, nonsense and it can also be a really great educational resource so again right. I think it's just a matter of making sure that you're following the right people like you said and and strength coach network for sure that that to me is uh, one of the best educational resources out there, man. They have nothing yeah. but straight gold uh, yeah. presentations and stuff on there. And when you sit down and think about it, you know, like 30, 30 some odd bucks a month. Um, yeah. You know, it's for the value that you get. Um, they just got a ton of really good content. So um, this was something uh, kind of funny that I saw when I was, you know, kind of scrolling through your through some of your social media stuff the other day, kind of while we're on the topic of social media. Um, and you talked about it a little bit there too, you know, making sure that you're following the right people. I saw on your, uh, I think it was on your intern manual or curriculum, uh, something mm -hmm. about, you know, requirements don't include, uh, you know, a mustache, a long beard, tight polos, large amounts of juice or an SEC connection. Um, yeah. You know, the typical, the uh, typical stereotypical strength coach, um, I guess. Right. Um, and, you know, not that there's necessarily anything inherently wrong with that, but that does seem to no. be, I think there's a lot of, a lot of young guys. And I know I was this way, you know, when I kind of came into the field because I am not that, um, yeah. you know, I was <laughs> a little here. bit, I was a little bit insecure about some of that stuff. So maybe, maybe talk a little bit about uh, some of those, you know, stereotypical strength coach things that we've got going on in the field and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some things that we can do to, 
to correct those or um, just improve the field overall in general. Right. And I, like, I, I want to go and say, if, if you're the guy that, you know, wears the tight polo that has gone to an SEC school, likes making a lot of noise, okay, that's you, that's you. I'm not, I'm not one to judge. Um, but like you said, you know, that, that's not how, you know, I, I'm not that, you know, but my biggest thing is if we are going to, you know, classify strength coaches as good strength coach, bad strength coach, it shouldn't be how much the guy benches, how big the beard is, how tight his shirt is, and how much noise he can make. Now, if he or she, if that's their personality and that's their niche, but on top of that, they, you know, bring out good content. Um, they're very, very edu- they're, they have their kind of niche and strength conditioning. They're all about helping other strength coaches, and I'm all about it. Um, I just think sometimes um, a prime example is one of my first days um, with our internship class here, I asked them, you know, what are, who are some strength coaches that, you know, and, you know, I hear all oh, the guy, the guy with the big mustache, the, the guy that wears that tight polo, didn't know them by name, but they knew them by what they saw on social media. Uh, so again, that kind of goes by to following the right people. Um, but moving forward, I, I just think we need to, as a, um, like as an industry is, you know, kind of what you're doing with this podcast, you know, bring on different people from different schools, you know, listen to what they have to say. It might be someone you've never heard of, but might be doing some of the best programming out there. Um, I think just, you know, bringing the right people on and putting the right people in the lack of better word spotlight. Um, I, I think that's what, how we have to move forward. Um, it doesn't always have to be the coach that has the big logo, you know, not that the bad thing, like Scott Kuhn right now, he's down at um, LSU. He's one of the smartest strength coaches that I've listened to. All right. Um, but it's just it's just kind of balancing both things. Like, don't don't just think because if I'm going to hire someone and I see, you know, this strength coach coach at Texas A&M, I'm going to hire him or her over this guy that was at Springfield, uh, you know, like Springfield University of Springfield up in Massachusetts, who has also has a great strength conditioning program. Um, you know, I think it's just us listening to the content, listening to what these coaches have to say. And, you know, don't just look at how much noise they're making or what they're wearing. I think that, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and just getting different people's names out there. So that's why I love what you're doing with this podcast is smaller school coaches. You know, they don't get, they don't get put on ESPN about how much noise they're making on the sideline, or they don't get put on ESPN about their team doing curls before a game. You know, it's just getting more names out there and getting more content out there, I think is the um, direction we need to move in as an industry. Yeah, I mean, 100%. That was, you know, I was actually, uh, I was a graduate assistant with uh, Gage Rozier whenever he kind of birthed the idea for this podcast. And, and that was exactly it, right? It's, it's try to highlight, you know, the coaches that are that are at these smaller schools, because one, like, there's a lot of really great coaches that just aren't getting, they aren't getting attention because they're not on sports center. They're not you know, they're not the ones that are getting the the spotlight special on college game day or whatever. Um, right. But also because they got a lot of unique challenges, right? Like yeah. working, working with, you know, 15 plus teams and 500 athletes, like you might at a division three school with only, you know, you and maybe another full-time staff member is a, is a whole different ball game than yeah. working with 120 football guys and having, having six full-time staff members, right? They're just, they're two very different things. So um, you know, that's, that's been the goal of the podcast and, you know, we've been fortunate to, to be able to spotlight a lot of really great coaches that are, that are doing some really great things. So, right. you know, kind of along with that, right. We, we talk about like, you know, making the big time where you're at, right. That is, that is the namesake of the show. That's the, the mantra that we kind of live by, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what you are doing specifically at Simpson right now to try to provide right, that big time college experience for, you know, your division three athletes there? I think it's just um, teaching our teams that when you come into the weight room, you're going to, you're going to get trained for your sport. We're going to treat you like the athlete that you came here to be, you know, so I'm not, I'm not going to train my men's basketball team the same way I'm going to train my football team. Um, I think teaching them and educating them and not just saying it, but actually showing it that your programming your approach to program is going to be a little different than all the other sports. Um, I think sometimes aside from football, a lot of sports come in with the mantra thinking, 
you know, oh, they're going to make us bench, squat, and deadlift every single day. Um, you know, they're going to make us get as strong as possible, and that's all they're going to worry about. Um, I think the biggest thing with these, um, all these other sports is, you know, if you came here to play softball, I'm going to train you to get better at softball. If you came here to play baseball, okay, I'm going to train you to get better at baseball. You know, I, I'm not going to make you into a power lifter. Um, I think it's just showing them that you care about their sport, care about your performance, uh, care about their performance, um, and just care about them as people. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, my assistant the other day said it best to his baseball team, said, I don't, I don't care if you get a, you know, 10 pound bump on your split squat, you know, if you're not succeeding on the field or if you're not playing on the field, that his number one goal was to make sure they're succeeding on the field. Um, so it's just teaching them that we care a lot more about just pushing numbers in the weight room. You know, we care about, you know, how your classes are going, how, how you're taking care of yourself outside of class, how you're performing on the field or the court. Now, the weight room, the weight room is just, you know, it's just a competitive edge that you give teams. You know, I, it's not the end all be all. It's just something that you can use um, to teach the athletes that there's, you know, more than life than just how much weight you can put on your back or how much you can pick up off the ground. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing for us is just talking to our athletes and I let them, them know we care, I guess, and know, know that we're not going to train them the same way they might have gotten trained if, you know, they went to a school that just worried about, you know, the big three, the, the bench, squat, and deadlift. Um, just kind of educating them and showing them that you came here to become better at your sport. That's what we're going to give you. No, that's great. And I, you know, I think there's something, um, something really powerful to be said about, um, you know, giving that kind of individual training spin to, to each team, right? It, right. You know, we're still going to hinge, we're still going to squat, we're still going to push pull. Um, but you can make that look different for an athlete and make the weight room less intimidating, right? right. Like, doing a dumbbell bench and a barbell bench aren't really that different. But if you've got a, you know, a, a women's basketball player, for instance, maybe that comes in that's never been in the weight room before, like that may seem a lot less intimidating than, than hopping straight on a barbell bench. Um, Absolutely. And it can, it can kind of work the other way too, right? Like I've seen a lot of athletes that you can give them uh, maybe less suspicious or less intimidating exercises and then they, they get really into it and they love it. And then all of a sudden they're asking for some of the other stuff, right? They want to get pushed, but it, yeah. it kind of gave them a bridge to like build some confidence in the weight room. And I think that's something that that's super underrated as a strength coach. Like, don't just say, you know, well, you know, they're all athletes. They're all the same. Like we're going to train them all the same. Well, yeah, yeah, to some extent, but there are, there are little nuanced ways that you can, you know, you can get that that uh, maybe cross country runner that that's scared of getting strong, right? They think they just need muscular endurance. They're scared to get strong. You might get away with being able to get them to move more weight by putting them on a split squat instead of a back squat, right? Like, yep, exactly. like it, it can be, you know, you just got to kind of play a little, I want to say mind games, but it's kind of mind games with them a little bit, right? Like it's, yeah, it's just finding ways to, to tailor that experience to them and, and give them confidence to, actually come in and, and strive to get better every single day. Yeah. I think a big part of it is too, is educating them of why you do certain things. Like I, I, we tell our teams all the time, if you come into our office and ask us, you know, why a trap bar jump instead of a power clean, and we can't answer that, then we're not doing our job right. Like we, uh, we hold, we take pride in being able to educate our athletes on why we do things, why we program this way and not this way. You know, why this, this many reps, why not this many, um, so I think that's a big piece of it too, is that explaining why is this going to be good for a cross country runner? Why is this going to be good for a golfer or a volleyball player? Um, and that once they kind of learn that and you can defend it, I think that goes a very long way with them as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely communication is king, right? Like yep. at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how good your program is. If, if you can't get your your athletes on board with what you're doing, like they're going to come in and give subpar effort and, you know, you can have the worst program in the world, but if you, you know, attack it with great effort, you're going to be in, yep. a, in a much better spot than you are with perfect program and, and no effort at all. So that communication yep. piece is definitely, you know, super underrated and something that, again, I think a lot of times as strength coaches, we kind of get egos a little bit about like, well, hey, you know, I'm the one that's been doing this for, you know, five, 10, 15 years, like, don't question yep. me, just do what I say. 
um, and you know you'll make progress. Well, that's it's not the way things work, right? Like, right. I mean, if you think back to any coaches that you've responded well to in in the past, right? You might respond to to that kind of guy, but you, I know for me anyway, I was always drawn to the coach that could be really demanding and push me really hard. But like, you know, I never felt like it was a do this because I said so. It was always, um, you know, they were finding ways to communicate things clearly to me and and kind of building buy-in that way instead of just saying, well, yeah. I'm the boss, I'm in charge, do as I say. Right. No, so. I, I had, I had uh, one of my old mentors, bosses, whatever you want to call them, once told me that programming was overrated um, because like you said, if you write the perfect program and you're going to tell all your athletes that there's, there's nothing wrong with it, you know, just do this, this, and this and can't answer why you do it. Okay. You're not going to get as much of that as you were if you wrote an average program and got hundred percent by it. I, I can write an average program and convince my athletes like, this is why we're doing it. It's going to benefit you as, you know, as an athlete, um, earn the respect from them first. All right. So then they can buy into stuff like that. Um, so I, I think the number one thing I'm sure thousands of coaches have said it before is, you know, buy-in is the most important thing. Yep. I, again, couldn't agree more. Um, that's great stuff, coach. Uh, so kind of moving on here a little bit, um, you know, as a strength coach or just a, a human being in general, right. We're going to get thrown a lot of hurdles and face a lot of adversity. Um, yep. you know, as we, as we work through our career and, um, you know, just life in general. So maybe talk, uh, talk a little bit about uh, maybe some major hurdles that you've kind of had to overcome and, and how facing and overcoming those things have, you know, kind of changed you and developed you as a person. Um, man, that's a loaded question. Um, I, I, I think at first, like this where it all began with me with strength conditioning, I was, I was never the biggest guy or the fastest guy or the smartest guy. Um, you know, I, I, I needed to find something that was going to help with those type of things. And then I, I discovered the weight room. You know, I, I, I found, um, I found the thing that I was passionate about. Um, I was very interested in how the human body works and how you can develop it. Um, I started working out with a trainer back home in in his basement. He had one, one rack, uh, one tower, um, and like four or five sets of dumbbells. And that was the day, you know, I fell in love with strength and conditioning. You know, I, Still am not, never was, never will be the biggest, fastest, or strongest guy. Um, but the weight room gave me that confidence to find something that I was passionate in. Um, so that's why, like I said, that's why I went to Central. Um, every person that has made a huge impact on me has been a coach in my life, uh, aside from like my dad, grandpa, and family and stuff. Um, but I've had a lot of coaches come and go, and all of them have made huge impacts on my life. And, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. Um, whatever I decided to do. Um, so I became a strength coach because not so I can write an awesome program or not so I can watch an athlete trap bar 550 or run a, you know, four flat, you know, I, I be, I game into the coaching world so I can change lives and impact life, you know, and that goes back to making the big time where you are. If I can go through each day and make some sort of impact on uh, one person. All right. Then I'm doing my job right. And, you know, that's why I got into it. Um, and, Moving forward, however long I'm into this industry, my number one goal every single day is kind of, you know, change someone's life the same way strength and conditioning did for me. Um, whether that's giving them a little bit of confidence or having them get over a hurdle that they haven't been able to get over or just having a conversation with them asking um, about how their day went or how their family's doing and stuff like that. Um, so I think just learning from my coaches, uh, learning from experiences in the weight room and on the football field, um, I guess that I don't know if I answered your question, but that's kind of the be best answer I could give you. Um, just, you know, I had a huge impact. Uh, I've, I've had coaches make a huge impact on me and I, I want to do the same with the athletes that I work with. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It is kind of a loaded question. It's always a, yeah. always a tough one, always a tough one to answer, but, um, you know, I like to like to see, uh, you know, cause we preach a lot to our athletes, right. To, to face adversity head on and, yeah. and to overcome. And, um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, from the, the weight room to real life, like one of the biggest, like carryover transfer that we can have is like teaching people to struggle through difficult times and, and attack adversity head on. And, you know, that can serve them really well, uh, throughout the rest yeah. of their life, not just, you know, their athletic careers. So, 
Uh, well, this has been awesome, Coach. Um, I don't want to take up, you know, too much of your time here. I know you're really busy, uh, especially with the transition between the winter and spring sports here. And you, right. know, you guys are getting ready to go into spring break here. So I'm sure you got plenty you can be doing. Um, but before we get finished here, I've got just a quick finisher. It's just five quick questions. Um, All right. You know, doesn't have to be doesn't have to be long drawn out answers. Just first thing that comes to mind, fire them off at me. All right, I can do that. All right, here we go. So first one, favorite office snack. Favorite office snack is Death Wish coffee. Oh, there we go. There we go. Always got to have the caffeine, right? Yep. Uh, how about favorite book? Favorite book is Atomic Habits. Uh, hobby outside of training bow fishing bow fishing okay that's a new one i don't know if we've had that one yet uh all right how about this 15 minutes to train yourself what are you gonna do uh i'm gonna do a contrast circuit i'm going to do a trap bar isopole trap bar jump assisted jump free jump measuring each jump on our plyo map love that always about performance yeah all right uh and then how about a uh, another small school strength coach that you think's killing it and deserves a shout out? Am I allowed to pick someone on my own staff? Sure. Yeah, I, I'd like to give a shout out to my assistant, Matt Costas and Segura. Um, he's only 24 years old, just got out of a master's degree, and he's been killing it working with, you know, five, six teams right out of school. Um, he could probably do his job better than me. Um, and hopefully one day we'll get a job like I have and you can bring him on this podcast. Absolutely, man. Uh, now hire people who are, uh, who, you know, kind of fill in your deficiencies. That's, yep. that's the the best thing you can do whenever you're hiring somebody. Don't, don't just, uh, you know, look for somebody that's, that's not intimidating, find somebody that pushes you and challenges you and, um, can improve upon the things that you're not very good at. So that's, that's great. Um, Absolutely. All right. So if anybody, you know, that's listening today wants to uh, maybe get in contact with you and just hear a little bit more about what you got going on at Simpson, what would be the, uh, the best way to get in contact with you? Um, my main social media is Twitter. Um, so if you go to at Sam underscore 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 Schmitz, um, you can find me there, shoot me any message. Um, other than that, go on Simpsons website. You can find my email and phone number on there if you want to get in contact with me as well. But Twitter is probably the best way to go. Awesome. And we can uh, we can go ahead and, and throw some some links of that stuff down in the show notes for you guys if you want to you want to reach out to Coach Schmitz and and just ask him a little bit more about the uh, the awesome things he's got going on there at Simpson. I know um, just from you know, following him here over the last last few weeks and just kind of looking through what he's got going on on social media pages, uh, doing some really big time things there at Simpson. So we appreciate, appreciate you that. coming on, coach, um, you know, and keep making keep making a, a big time strength conditioning experience for for your athletes there at Simpson. I will. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me on. All right. Thank you.